Okay guys, this is going to be the lesson on responsive CSS and this is basically taking um, some custom CSS to change the whips and the general look and feel of the, of the layout which only gets applied when the screen size or more specifically the browser size gets down to a certain width. We can actually detect the width of the browser and we can say hey for this width for this width you know apply some different CSS here to you know to make it more readable uh, for mobile devices. So a simple example would be you know when we get the screen size down to around here which is you know would be assuming we're kind of on a, on a mobile device you know our three columns here probably aren't going to be readable. <laughs> so we probably want to have some CSS here which switches these three columns down to one column and so they all stack underneath each other. So some simple things like that. <clears throat> um, but in this lesson today we're going to focus mainly on the top um, header here and then mainly our navigation because I mean let's face it our navigation is the most important part of the entire website so once we get down to uh, mobile if people can't click the buttons then it's effectively useless so we want to make sure that um, we've we've made an appropriate design pattern for our menu and people can access it so um, and I'll show you actually what we're going to build we go to Photoshop so this is how it kind of looks on the desktop and this is how we're going to build it so when it resizes down this header area here, we've got our links and our logo. We'll just um, here we go. We'll just stack. So we'll have our logo. Our menu, um, we'll introduce a menu button, and then we'll have the list of our links, which appear all in one line. Um, well, have, have a line each themselves, and appear stacked underneath, which is far more usable for a mobile device. So let's get stuck into it. Let's see the first place we want to start. So. In order to do anything with responsive CSS, and responsive CSS is just normal CSS, all it is is just wrapped inside a media query which detects the width, that's all it is. But yeah, it's just normal CSS we're running. Um, but the very first thing we need to do in order for the browser to interpret that is we need to include a meta tag which sets the viewport. It's just a real simple one-off thing you do at the very start. Once it's done, it's done forever. Okay, so let's look at that first. So in our index.html file, you'll see at the top here in our head, this is where we have all our metadata. So we set the character set, um, which is basically just the encoding of the text for the web browser. Um, we have our title, which is you know what appears up here in the tab. Then we link our style sheets and a bunch of things that don't really appear on the actual main body of the site. So this is where we need to put in our meta tag for the viewport. And we put it underneath here. So we have another meta tag and Basically, what we do is it's it's just um, the name is viewport. But it's one of those things that you kind of have to type once and never have to bother typing again. <laughs> and what I actually do is I actually keep a little text file on my projects called snippets, and I have a bunch of little text snippets that I can copy and paste into different projects. So here, for example, I've already got the the actual meta tag already written out. So I do recommend you guys do something similar here, and we've got these media queries that we're looking at later on in this lesson. But for this one, I'm just gonna grab this meta tag here. I'm gonna copy it, I'm gonna paste it. And I'll just take you through what it means. Basically, the, the, um, the meta tags are extra bits of information which are included in the document. So things like Google search engine, uh, for example, you know, you could have a meta tag which is called description. And then that's the little bit of text description which appears in the search listing. So a bunch of extra little things and like Facebook and social media, you know, they use these little meta tags as well. So we're, we've got a specific meta tag here called viewport. And what happens is that the browsers see this and we're telling them to set the width to the, desi to the device width and we're telling them to set the initial scale to one. And basically, long story short, what, the, what this is doing is um, it's, it's telling the browser that um, this website, you know, we're handling all the responsive stuff. So w without this, the browser would actually grab the website and actually zoom out. You know how it used to be back in the old days? I mean, when the, um, the iPhone first kind of came out, you know, you'd, you'd go on Safari and go to the website and, um, and the website would be shrunken. It'd be zoomed right out and the whole thing would be in that tiny little screen. This is basically avoiding that. This is saying, hey, don't zoom out. Set the initial scale just to one and set the width to the, to the device width. And this is going to stop the device from, you know, the pinching, zooming in and out. So this is going to lock it down to that width. And this is perfect because that gives us the chance to do all the whips and all the all the control of the layout with our own CSS. So yeah, there we go. It's just one thing you include once, you paste it in, and there it is. So let's save that. So now that's the very first step. And then the second step is actually in our CSS, 
we need to um, add a media query. So the media query just basically detects and says, hey, you know, between this width and this width, you know, apply this CSS. So this is something we do at the very bottom because remember, CSS is, is stands for cascading style sheets. So it means that, you know, it cascades throughout the file. So, you know, if I put a rule here, this rule is going to override a right rule that we put over here. So whatever comes at the end is, is taken to be, um, you know, is going to be is the most latest one applied. So at the very bottom, we're going to put um, a new chapter here in terms of putting all our responsive stuff at the bottom of the page. So I'm going to put a code comment just so I can see this as I'm scrolling from my file, just to make it easy for myself. I'm going to go responsive awesomeness. There we go. And always remember to close off a comment. We do a star, then a forward slash. So this is letting me know once I've got down to this part of the style sheet that everything after here is going to be specific CSS, which is only for you know mobile or tablet devices. So the very first thing to do now is actually set a media query. So to do that, we go at media, like that. And then we're going to target screens. So screen, and then we're going to say and. And then in normal brackets, we're going to go max width 767 Oops. pixels. And then just like how we do our curly brackets for any normal CSS selector, we just do a curly bracket there, come down, and then make sure it's ended off there. So basically this means any, any CSS we have applied inside here is going to be only applied when the browser is down to this width you know, or less. Because it basically says, you know, maximum width for 767. So once it goes past that width, as soon as it hits 768, none of this will apply. But as soon as it hits 767 and below, this will apply. Okay, hope that makes sense. And again, this is the kind of thing you put inside your snippets, like I've done over here. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah, max width 767. I've just kept it as a nice little snippet there. So you're gonna need to just copy and paste it in if you wanna save some time. Um, and I'm gonna put a little comment here, because I mean, I want to remind myself that this is for mobile devices, like that. Because I'll have another one of these a bit further down the page, down here for tablets. But I'm going to start my mobile for now. All right, so once we've done this, as we've learned through the rest of the tutorials, one of the first things we want to do is um, actually test to see where it's working. So let's come in here, let's go body, and let's set the background color to red. It's a nice, real simple way of testing if it's actually working or not. So let's do that. Let's go back to our file, refresh, and if it's worked, as we get smaller and smaller, oh, wait till it refreshes. Ah, the internet's going quite slow right now with the Google fonts. Here we go. So that's the website as it normally is. Ah, <laughs> you can see here that the font has, has defaulted back to a cursive font. Ah, there it is, it's back again. It's just um, the internet's going slow while I upload to YouTube there. Okay, so as we get the browser smaller, as soon as it hits 767 or less, there we go, the background goes red. And as soon as it gets bigger, it's gone. Cool. So that's confirmation that this is actually working. So that's always the very first thing to check. So now that's working, I can get rid of that. Cool. So we're at a we're at a very good point now. We've got we're at a very good starting point. We can actually start doing some CSS changes um, and actually have them work on a mobile. So let's see. Go back to our PSD and let's just get back to what we're actually building. So we're converting this menu here to something like this. So, in order to do that, let's have a look. Let's go back to our current file. Let's just have a little look at how it's all working. So, the header itself, so this block up here, let's inspect that. There we go. I remember that we've actually got a fixed height on it. Remember 50 pixels? So, if we want to go down to mobile size and have this height automatically expand when our menu gets bigger and it's, it's stacked on top of each other, this height 50 pixels is not going to be useful. So we're going to be able to turn that off, don't we? So let's, that's probably the first thing we want to do. So let's go into um, our responsive awesomeness. And we're going to grab our header tag. And we're going to say height auto. And you know what? I'm going to put a different background color just so I can make sure I can see what's going on. Background color of red. And we're going to put orange just so we can differentiate it. All right, let's refresh the page. Tell you what, it's going to go a little bit slow right now because of the internet, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come back down here and just, just going to get rid of that jQuery. I'll come a bit later. Don't worry about that. Um, I'm just going to turn off that Google font for now. 
it'll make the refresh a lot faster. There we go, really fast. Cool, all right, so as I scroll, let's get back to where we were, as I come down to this kind of size, the height of our header now should be automatic and it should be orange. I mean, that's what we told it to do down here. We've said height automatic and, and background orange. And let's inspect and have a look. There's our header. And you can see that it's working because on Chrome over here, it's telling me that you know the header background color used to be that color, used to be 50 pixels, but it's now crossed those out. These are now been overridden by these two here based on my responsive CSS, my media crew here. See, so this is all working, that's good. But it's actually not showing, the height's not coming through. As I hover over, you can see here the little tag pops up that says 400 and zero pixels. That, that zero is the height. So it's got zero height, which, which is telling me that it obviously is not picking up the height of these elements inside of it. And as we guessed, yep, these elements have floated. Ah, so there's the problem. So the fact that my logo's floated and my nav is floated, uh, actually my nav isn't floated, but the fact, uh, oh sorry, the UL is. So that's, that's, that's where the problem is. So yeah, we can instantly see here now that the the header and the UL inside our nav is floated. So the header has no idea how tall it is. That's why we can't see it. So the real culprit is as well is, is these um, this logo file here. And we, we got hold of that by going image.logo, didn't we? So let's let's do that in our CSS for mobile here. So let's go image.logo. Let's get rid of that float. Okay, turn the float off. Ah, there we go. So now it's picking up the height of the, the logo. But we've still got our nav down here, which is expanding past that. I mean, this orange should really go down right below, you know, to where our, our menu is. Um, but it's not. It's only picking up the height of the of the image, of the logo image. So we also need to attack this UL in here because the nav itself doesn't have any, you know, this nav with a class name of main menu doesn't have any CSS applied, you know. It's only really picking up the, the normalized and that border box thing. Um, so the UL here we can see is the culprit. That's where float right is. If we turn that off, that's going to save our problems. So you'll see your CSS, responsive CSS is a lot about resetting things, you know, that have already been set in the main CSS file. So we kind of want to reset that now. And how do we apply that? It's this little bit of CSS here, isn't it? This is our actual selector. So I'm going to copy that, save myself some time, paste it in. Oops, oops I put a curly bracket. Get rid of that. Cool, so now I'm gonna say um, float and none. There we go. Refresh that. Ah, beautiful. There we go. Cool. So, and obviously you can see it turns orange as it goes to mobile. And turning it orange was just a useful way of me actually seeing if it's working or not. So I can get rid of that orange now. It doesn't serve this purpose. Cool, so there we go. We can see that the header is actually dynamically changing in height, which is good because that's what, that's the effect we want to get here with our menu. So let's have a look at the next thing we want to do. The next thing we want to do really is, I mean, the problem with these these list items is they're appearing in line, aren't they? That's why they're next to each other, which was ideal for our desktop because that's exactly what we wanted. We wanted to all appear next to each other in line. But for this situation, we kind of want each menu item, say home, about us, to be on its own separate line, which is what we've determined here in our um, <clears throat> our Photoshop file. So let's see, what's the easiest way we can do that? I mean, how do we get an object to appear on its own line and be greedy and not have anything next to it? Yep, you guessed it, it's display block. So let's do that. Um, in order to do that, this is the selector we need to use to target these allies. So let's come under here and we kind of keep all these grouped up, you know? So I mean, we've already gone nav main UL, so this is, this is one, one level beyond that, we're now grabbing the LI. And we want this LI to be display block. And I'm gonna put a background color on it. Again, really handy when you guys are learning to do this kind of thing. I'm gonna put a background color of red. I'm gonna click refresh. Ah, here we go. That's looking a lot better. Okay, so just a simple reset, really. I mean, just simply resetting it to, well, not resetting, but setting the display properly to block has immediately given us a really good result. It's put everything on its, on its own line, and we haven't had to mess around with whips and floats, none of that kind of stuff. Just display block did a lot of the work for us. So that's really cool. We can now see that we've got a list of um, menu items down there. Um, and probably the first thing we wanna do, I mean, if you were to look at that on a mobile device, then it's gonna be pretty hard to 
um, to press one of these buttons because if you, your button, if your finger presses, it's going to be an area about that big. So you'll you'll probably accidentally end up pressing three buttons, you know. So it's not really ideal for um, for touch screens. We need to make sure we space these out quite a bit, and that's what we've done here. You know, we've got some pretty big gaps here. So the question comes. So we need to add a gap. That's that's the that's the goal. Then you've got to wonder, hmm, okay, well I've got a list item, but I've also got an anchor tag inside of it. See what I mean? The anchor tag is actually the clickable link. And there's my ally. So do I add, you know, marginal padding on the A or the ally? These are the things you need to think about. So I've done a little example here <coughs> just to show you guys like a bit of an x-ray of how it kind of looks. So this is the current situation. Um, we've got a, actually the current situation is actually more, actually no, I'll get, I'll get to that in a moment. This might be easier to explain. Um, we've got our LI, which is wrapping an anchor tag inside of it. So if we were to um, get a couple of these, you know, so right now it's, it's like this, which is just, they're too close, okay? So if we were to add padding, say, on the LI, it would end up looking like this. You know, padding on the top and bottom. It would look like that. And that kind of, you know, achieves our goal, doesn't it? If we had them stacked underneath each other like this, you know, that's going to be pretty good padding. I mean, people can easily see. But the problem is, let's pretend, and this is probably about the right kind of size, about that or so. Okay. This is the kind of area of a finger when it's clicking on a mobile device. So if we go to click, so this is quite a big gap here. So really, I mean, this fin area here is the only clickable area because this is the anchor tag. I mean, you, know, you can't click an ally. That's the whole point of having an anchor tag. It actually clicks off to a separate page or something. So this is the area we're, we're really concerned with. So if we add the padding on the, on the ally, it's, it's giving us the, the visual look that we want. But functionally, you know, we've got this big gap between. It's not really useful. So that's not really going to work. And this is important to know because I've even seen some advanced web developers or front end developers who still could miss this sometimes. So it's, it's really going to um, inhibit your usability. So let's turn that finger off. Let's delete those. And let's see what would happen if we put the padding in a much smarter place and actually put it on the A tag. That would be better, wouldn't it? And now, and then obviously the ally doesn't have any padding at all. The ally really is just an empty container for it to sit there. There we go. That like that, and that like that. Beautiful. So now our finger can go press, press, and obviously in theory this gap would be non-existent. So wherever the finger is, it's always going to be pressing at least one of the buttons. At least then you're not getting a dead zone in the middle where the finger's going to press and nothing happens. And that's just bad usability. The user's going to be sitting there confused, going, oh, it's not working. So now we know where we need to add our padding, don't we? <clears throat> so let's go in. The first thing I want to do though, I've got my LI appearing as red, don't I? Which is here. I want to also make a color for my anchor tag inside. So to get access to that, I use the selector of that with an A at the end. And I'm going to say, hey, I want the background color of this one to be green. Just so we can see it. Aha! So before we've got to our padding, we've already noticed something interesting, don't we? We've already noticed that, so if my finger was over here, where the red area is, that's just the LI, isn't it? And the LI isn't clickable, but the A is. So really the green area here is where it's clickable. So my finger's pressing over here, I'm not gonna be touching anything, you know? So we can instantly see that although display block is working great for our LI, the anchor tag inside just has an automatic width. It's just, just being as, as wide as the text. So we want this width to span 100% as well, don't we? So no matter where the finger is, it's always gonna be pressing um, on the links. So effectively, it's you know, it's like the situation like this really, isn't it? So if the finger comes along, it presses here, like no good. Press up here, it's okay. So we definitely want to make sure the anchor spans the full width. So that's what we're going to do first. And to do that, yep, you guessed it. Display block. That's what we need on the anchor. So we just go display block, save, come back, refresh. There we go. Now the entire green area, you can see the, my mouse cursor changes. There's a normal cursor and then the finger comes up. That's let me know this is actually a link. It's actually an anchor tag. So that's perfect. So that's the very first step done. Um, now we can add our padding in, can't we? So let's put padding on top of 30 pixels. Let's put 20 on, on the inside as well. 
Just give a bit of room to breathe. Ah, there we go. Actually, uh, that's quite a lot. <laughs> there we go. That's looking a bit better. Great. So now we see we've got a big clickable area. As I'm going through, um, yeah, it doesn't matter where I click over here, over there. Obviously, right now it's just going to my root directory. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's great. That's that's let me know exactly where my clickable area is. And this is why we use the background colors to to give us that indication. And the next step I want to do is actually increase the font size. So I mean, I could increase the font size of the A tag or the LI. The pa the power is, I mean, this is what's going to happen in CSS. You're going to get this choice of like, oh, where do I do it? You know, it kind of works on both. So do I put it here or put it here? I mean, at the end of the day, really, the A is inside the LI, doesn't it? So it's always going to inherit the font size. If we set it on the I, the LI, that means the A is going to get it anyway. So that's probably the best way to do it. So I'm going to go font size, and let's say about 18 pixels. Just something a bit bigger so people with whoops, mobile devices can see it. Actually, probably even bigger than that. I'd say about 22. There we go. Looking a lot better. Cool. And as you see, when we hover over our inspector, you can see where everything is. There's our logo. There's our nav. Oh, here's what's interesting. See this gap on the left and right here? So that's obviously what if, if the person's finger clicks on you know the edge of their phone, they're not going to get that area there. When we really shouldn't have that gap. I mean, as soon as that finger's there, they should be able to instantly click the home button, you know? So we want to get rid of this gap. So let's use inspector to find out, you know, where is that gap coming from? Let's hover over our nav. Let's hover over our LI. No, it's not coming from oh are you well? Let's go to our LI. Ah, there we go. So as I'm hovering over my LIs here. You can see the little orange bit of color appears on the left and right. And that orange is the Chrome inspector telling me that's a margin. So if I hover over and click it, you'll see over here, here we go, look. The top margin and bottom margin is zero, but the left and right margin is 20 pixels, which is that gap. So let's just set that to zero. Ah, it works, cool. So all we need to do really is just find out, make a rule in our CSS for this LI and get rid of the left and right margin because right now it's set to 20, which is like that. So that's what we do. So there we go, it's the LI, which we've got already set up here. If we just come down here now, we go margin. We could have set the, all the margins to zero, you know? But I mean, later on, you know, we, we might actually have a, a top and bottom set in the main CSS. So we don't really want to reset things that aren't broken, you know? So th this is the thing with responsive CSS. You don't want to go resetting everything. You're just resetting things that need to be you know, need to be tweaked. So it's actually much safer for us to specifically say, hey, margin left zero and margin right zero. So at least later on up in the document, if we set the top and bottom values, you know, they're not gonna be touched down here, okay? Refresh, ah, there we go, much better. So it's going right to the edge now, and we've got full clickable range of these buttons. So now we're pretty happy with that, and you can see when we go back to our desktop, it's looking fine, come right back down, there we go, beautiful. Now we know that we can get rid of our colors, can't we? Let's just get rid of the background color green for our A tag, and also the background color red for our LI. Now when we go back and have a look, it should be looking pretty damn good. Excellent. So that's the first step. I mean, we've actually just, you can see with you know just a little bit of CSS, we've managed to reset a few things, our, our header, we've got rid of that float on our logo, we've got rid of the float on our actual um, URL inside our nav, um, and then we've changed the, the list items to stack on top of each other, increase the font size, put some nice padding on our buttons, made a block so we can click it. So it's not really all that much we've done and already we've quite drastically changed the header, way more usable. So the next step really, um, let's go back to our Photoshop file and see what we're building here. We want to get this menu button, don't we? So because what's going to happen is naturally we wouldn't really want you know, the mobile site to have the menu showing all the time. It's really it's really more appropriate that, um, you know, the, do, 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 do. let's put that in like this. Let's take that off as well. Oop, no, it's going on the floor. There we go, cool. And we realistically we want our menu to look like that, don't we? And then when we click the menu button, it all expands out underneath like that, okay? So, but the first, before we do that, we actually want to add in this button, don't we? So to do that, we need to go to our index file and actually put the HTML first. So let's come down and let's see, we've got our header, we've got our logo, and then we have our nav. So we want it to appear before our nav and after our logo. So we'll put it here. 
and it's going to be a clickable link, so therefore we need to use an anchor tag. Right now it's going nowhere, so just use hash, title tag, we're just going to say, hey, um, show, uh, show mobile menu, like that, and we'll just say menu. There we go, I save that, head back, oops, keep clicking home there, there we go, cool, there's our little menu link showing up. Um, so in order for us to style it, so it actually looks like a button, obviously we need to give it a class, don't we? So we're gonna go class, and we're gonna call this one the mobile menu button. I'll just use a shorthand button like that, which is quite useful. Um, so what we could do now is I'm gonna copy this class name and go into my CSS and start styling it. But I mean, the style of the button isn't really, because remember all the styles we're putting here are specifically for mobile. And although this menu, button appears on the mobile site, I mean, we might want to use it somewhere else. It's not really, I mean, all the CSS here really is about changing how it looks on mobile and showing and hiding things. But the actual button class, you know, for our button here doesn't necessarily need to be inside here. You know, so we should put it out, you know, above our responsive in our main CSS. So we're gonna go dot mobile menu button. And this is where we can start styling it to look like a button. But before we do that, I do have a memory of the fact that we did make a button recently, didn't we? Let's have a look. There we go, we made a button here, our check it out button. And the thing is really, when you look at the style of that button, and the style of this one, they're pretty similar. I mean, the fact is that, you know, there's a good chance of using buttons throughout your entire website, and most of them are gonna look probably the same, and maybe there'll just be a few variations, like one's orange, one's white, and one's maybe a bit smaller, one's a bit bigger, but at the end of the day, you've got one kind of common style of how a button looks, don't you? So what we can do is we can save ourselves some trouble. I mean, we could go up to, we could actually find the CSS for this button and just copy and paste it, couldn't we? If we scroll to the top of our page, there it is. That class we made called dot button. So it's the background color to orange, it's the color white, gets rid of the text decoration, put some rounded corners, all that kind of stuff. So what we could do is we could just copy that CSS and paste it down here. There we go, from our mobile menu. Like that, click save and back, refresh, and there it is. But you're probably thinking that's pretty inefficient, and it is. <laughs> it's pretty poor coding because, you know, if we change the style of this button with the, the button class at, the, at the, uh, the very top here, you know, it's now separated from this one. I mean, this is just repeat code, isn't it? It's a bit redundant. So we shouldn't really copy and paste that. It's a bad way of doing it. Instead, what we can actually do is, if we come down to our check it out button, there it is, there's the class, BTN, the button class, we can actually just piggyback this on here. Because in CSS, you can actually use multiple classes. So here we've got you know, the class equals mobile menu button. We could actually, on the front of there, say, hey, use the these two classes, use the button class and use this class. So if we save that, and you'll see that I've done, I've done no CSS for this button whatsoever. All I've done is piggybacked and added on the button class to start with. If I refresh, there it is and I haven't had to copy and paste any code. So it's already using that, that menu button class. Because all we really wanna do is use that existing class as we have it right now, and just maybe change a few things like the background color. So this is what we can do now. We can go to our style sheet, there's our mobile menu button, and we can now say, hey, background needs to be white. Save that, oops, white like that. Fresh, ah, there we go, cool, we're getting somewhere. And let's say the color needs to be the background color of this, this header. So let's inspect that. There it is. I'm gonna copy that, paste it in. Beautiful, refresh. Cool, there we go. Excellent. So you can already start to see that we're using the existing styles here and all we're doing is just tweaking a few little colors. And, um, and the beauty of that is that if I come back now to my, you know, if, if later on you decide that you, know, you wanna get rid of the border radius on all your buttons, all you gotta do is just get rid of it here. Just Delete your border radius, come back, refresh. There we go, there's no border radius now. No curves on those corners, it's all square, and the same way with that one. So this is the power of using multiple classes, guys. And it's, um, yeah, you really get used to this once you start building a few sites. And you save yourself a lot of code when you start piggybacking off existing styles. So cool, we've got our menu button. We've styled it look white, it's pretty good. Um, I want it to be appearing on the right-hand side over here. So in this case, Using a float could be a nice, easy, simple way of doing that. So let's have a look. There it is, there's my mobile menu button. I'm gonna say 
float to the right. Cool, that's looking good. And I want to give it some margin as well. Maybe eight pixels on the top, 10 pixels on the right. Um, bottom left, maybe zero, zero. Ah, there we go. Much, much better. So now when someone's on a mobile device, they can easily click this button. And that's we're going to do the functionality for that in a second. But before we add the functionality for it to expand, which we're going to use um, jQuery, which is a library of JavaScript. Before we do that, you'll notice a problem. This is looking great for our mobile device. But as soon as we make the browser bigger back to desktop, ah, it's still there. But we, we don't really want it to be there, do we? We only really want it to show on mobile screens and hide by default everywhere else. So this is where it comes down to another property. Remember we have display, and we can go block, you know, we can go inline, you know, we can go, well, we can go inline block, we've got those, those are the three main properties. And there are a bunch of other ones which we're not gonna go into, which are a bit more advanced, but those are the three main ones. But there is a fourth one, which is super, super easy. It's just display, none. Really, really self-explanatory. <laughs> if I put that on, save it, go back to my page, refresh, and it's gone. If I inspect in here, my Chrome inspector, try and find it. There it is, there's my menu button. And you can see it's nowhere to be found on the page because it's display none. If I turn that property on and off, that's all it takes, just to show and hide it. So now we've got a more ideal situation, it's, it's hidden, but then that also means it's hidden on the mobile as well, isn't it? Because we've, we've put it up here in our main CSS file. So what we need to do is we need to come down here in our responsive and say, hey, if the screen is this small, if it's a mobile device, show this button, okay? So we're gonna copy that class, we're gonna come down. And in terms of the order of things here, I've got my header, my logo, my nav. This this menu button comes before the nav, doesn't it? So it's always just good practice to keep things in order. So there's my button, and I'm gonna say display. I'm going to go inline block actually, because it's not display block. Because display block would make 100% width, so. <laughs> Refresh, and there it is. So it's displaying now. If I inspect, you can see Chrome showing us all the mechanics of where it's coming from. There's my button. So naturally by default it's display none, um, but CSS, the browser has told me that nope, this has been ruled out because it's been overwritten by this bit of CSS here, CSS here in our responsive, which is display inline block. Perfect. So as I make the screen bigger, it disappears, come back down to mobile size, it reappears. So that's awesome. So that's the kind of stuff, this display inline block and, and display none is a really cool feature um, real simple CSS you can use. So say for example, you, you got one of these columns here which you want to hide. All you got to do is put a class on it and then in your responsive CSS, you simply just say, hey, this column display none you know, for responsive and then it'll disappear. So really cool things like that. Anyway, back to what we're doing. So we've now got a menu button to display on mobile, hide on desktop. Now we need to add the functionality so when someone clicks it, this thing expands. But the first thing you want to do really is when someone comes down to this screen size, we actually don't want this nav to appear by default, do we? It'd be more ideal if this nav is actually display none and it's hidden. And then when you click the menu button, it displays block. See what I mean? That'd be a real nice simple way to toggle it on and off. So ideally this nav here, name main menu, we need to have it be display. Oops play none, sorry, and it will hide. So that's what we want to do first. But obviously, we only want it to hide on mobile devices. So let's have a look here. That color coding's got a bit off. Oh, there we go, it's back. Um, all right, so we're gonna jump in here, just above the UL, and we're gonna, we're basically just grabbing the whole nav tag. We're not grabbing the UL inside, which is this thing here. We're just grabbing the whole container nav. And we're gonna say, hey, on mobile devices, which is where we're we're at right now, we're inside here. Display, done. Refresh, cool, there it is, it's hidden. So go back to desktop size, there's my nav tag, it's all there, as soon as it gets small, 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 yep, it completely disappears. And now this is where we add the magic of jQuery to have it display a block when you click this button. So, um, jQuery, let's think. Let's go back to our index our file. Uh, .html file. Um, so just a bit of a recap, just a real simple recap on what jQuery is. 
Um, to start with, we have a language called JavaScript. So JavaScript is the browser's programming language, which allows you to manipulate things um, on live on the page. You know, it doesn't need, necessarily need a page reload. So for example, you know, when you're on Facebook, you click someone's photo and it pops up and it loads on top of the content you look at before. That's, that's what JavaScript does. JavaScript is responsible for doing those cool things. So any kind of interactivity you have on the page, JavaScript is responsible for that. But JavaScript um, is is quite quite big and clunky and quite complex to learn and code. And not only that, it's um, I'm not putting it down. JavaScript is absolutely incredible. But it's um, back in the day, especially with different web browsers from Internet Explorer, Safari, Chrome, um, also Firefox, and all and Netscape, all those different browsers. They all kind of interpret interpreted JavaScript slightly differently. They had different ways of how they would go through the DOM, which is the, the document object model. Um, but basically, long story short, if you wanted to write any JavaScript code to do some functionality on the page, you'd have to write quite a lot of different code just to make it work on all browsers. And then, so over time, what happened was a bunch of JavaScript developers realized that, hey, there's a better way to do this. So they wrote a, a library for, for jQuery, well, for JavaScript, which is called jQuery. <laughs> Getting a bit tongue-tied here. <laughs> so jQuery is actually this massive library of all these tools. And the best analogy to use it is um, to apply to this is if you were going to build a car, you know, you would go and get the iron ore out of the ground, obviously to make you know the iron. And the iron ore itself, in this case, would be JavaScript, raw JavaScript. Then, if you actually want to turn it into anything useful to make a car, for example, the iron ore then needs to go um, and be turned into steel. So once it's turned into steel, like steel plates or poles, anything like that, that's actually something useful. And that's what jQuery does. It grabs the raw iron ore, like JavaScript, and turns it into like sheets and plates of metal, which can then actually be used. So it just turns into, um, it just gives you a toolbox, like a, like a library. And then on top of that, that's when you write your own jQuery commands and things to do all that funky functionality. So anyway, that's a quick crash course in what JavaScript and jQuery is. So in order for us to use it, we need to include it on a page. Just like we did when we included a Google font and some style sheets, we do the same for jQuery, but we don't actually put it in the head. We can, but what happens is that when the page loads, the, when, whenever you, you load a web page, it's gonna load all this stuff in the head first. And jQuery really, well anything JavaScript and jQuery, is really an enhancement. It doesn't necessarily need to load at the very start. So it's actually much better for the performance of our website to put it at the bottom. But don't put it at the very bottom, it has to be before the closing body tag, okay? And to write that, we're gonna use a script tag. We're gonna say script, and then we are going to say um, source, SRC. You're probably thinking it's href, like we did for link, but it's not, it's just how it is. <laughs> so we're gonna say, hey, this is a script tag, and this is gonna to link to a, a script file, which is JavaScript. And this is where we're gonna to link to our, our jQuery file that we've downloaded. And I've got it on the desktop here. There it is. It's jQuery-2.2.3.min.js, which is a JavaScript file. And the min just means it's been minimized, which means all the spaces and so forth have been compressed. You can see it looks quite ugly. That just means it's been compressed so the file size is nice and small. So I'm gonna copy that. I'm gonna go into my project folder and I'm gonna paste it in. So this is where I've got all the files in my project. I've now got my jQuery file there. And I'm actually going to copy the file name. So I've got it exact. Go back to my script here. I'm going to paste it in. So this is now saying, hey, in your index file, we're linking to a script, which is JavaScript, and it's saying, hey, this, this is where it is. And you'll see there it is on the left there. So this obviously has to be named exactly as the file name has been named. And simple as that. And then we have to actually have to close it as well. So it doesn't have anything inside of it. You can actually write, you know, jQuery and JavaScript inside these script tags, but for now, we're just linking to the file. We're just simply including the file, which is a library. So that's the very first step. And then underneath, we then want to link to our own file, which actually has all our all our own written jQuery. So this is just the library which it requires. And then we need to link to our own file. So same as what we've done before, we'll just go script, we're going to go source, and I've made one over here early which is just called main.js, okay, so I'm going to say main.js, and I'll end it off, okay, and that's all I need to do, so it's just at the very bottom of your page, include your jQuery first, and then your main.js, 
you know, if you include your, your main JS before your jQuery, it's not going to work because this, when you write your jQuery language in here, it needs the jQuery library to come first so it knows what's going on because it's all done in order. Okay. All right. So I've done that. Now I can open up my main JS file, which is over here, and this is what it looks like. So, like we've learned before, whenever we connect a style sheet or anything like that, the first thing we want to do is to test it to make sure you know that we've actually written this correctly. Make sure we haven't made any typos or spelled this wrong. It's always the first, what I call a sanity check, <laughs> to make sure we're looking at the right file. So let's come over here, and I'm going to write some really simple. This is actually just JavaScript because I mean, what's going on here is this main JS file. This line at the top, all you need to know really is this is just saying, hey, this is jQuery. So anything that happens inside here is jQuery language. Because without this line at the top here, um, you know, we start a curly bracket, and then we end it, and we end off the whole thing. That, that's very important. That needs to be at the very bottom to end this. That starts it, that ends it. What, what it's saying is that every single thing in here is, is jQuery, and this is required. Okay, so we're going to do a real simple command here. We're just going to go alert. And this is actually just raw JavaScript, because you can put raw JavaScript and jQuery inside of here, but you can't put jQuery outside, just for to know. This is just a real simple JavaScript function called alert, which makes a little pop-up come up, and I'm going to say, hello. So what's going to happen is, when the document loads, when it's ready, when, as soon as we refreshed our website in Chrome, the our index file is linking to our J, jQuery script, and then it's linking to our main JS script, which is over here, and it's going to say, hey, when it's loaded, just pop up a little alert box that says hello. Okay, so now if we refresh, let's just get back to normal desktop size, get refresh. Hey, there it is. Bingo, it's working. That's really good sanity check to do, just to make sure that you've actually got this working. So I can now delete that, because I'm pretty confident this is all working now. And this is where we add our functionality. So just to recap, let's, let's get back to our mobile site. So what we want to do is, we want, Whenever this button is clicked, we want our nav object, which is hidden right now, our nav tag. Let's have a look. Container, header. Oh, oh, sorry, it's in our header. Header. There it is. We want this tag here, our nav, which is main dash menu as a class. Right now it's display none. We want that to display block. That's all we want the button to do. We just want it to be display block, display none, okay? So to do that, we need to put some functionality for this button first. So this is what jQuery does. We're going to start off, and you don't need to learn too much of this right now because this is pretty much beyond the scope of what you're learning in this in this unit. But this is just the basics of what you can copy and paste into your projects to use as long as you keep the same class name. So um, a dollar sign is what always starts off with jQuery in, in small brackets uh, or normal brackets. We're now going to say, okay, grab me. Um, anything which has the class of uh, mobile menu dash button, which is this button here, as we can see. And always, if you are if you are unsure about what you've named a class, always come back and double check. Just I always just usually you know copy and paste just to make sure I've definitely written it 100 correct. There it is. Yeah. Now I'm going to say okay, when this is clicked, which is the click function. Inside of that, we have a function. And that's how you write jQuery. It's basically saying, when this object here is clicked, run some code in here. Okay. So again, we're going to do a little test to make sure we've done this properly first. I'm going to say, hey, when this is clicked, just have an alert that says, click me. Save that. Okay. Let's re refresh. So now when I click it, hey, click me. Cool. Awesome. So now at least I know at this level that this function is working. Great, so we basically want to put a bit of code in here that says, hey, when this is clicked, grab our, grab our nav tag, which is, has a class name of main menu, and just um, show it. Or better still, we can actually add a class to it. You know what I mean? That could be a really good way of doing it. So we do this. We're going to go dollar sign. First of all, we need to grab our nav tag, don't we? in order to do something with it. So we're going to say, hey, grab the nav.main-menu. Just to recap, that's this thing here. And we're saying, hey, we want this thing to, 
you know, when someone clicks this, we want a class to be added onto it that says open. And then when someone clicks it again, that class open gets removed. So really, we're just bolting on another class and then removing it. And then in CSS, we can control how it looks with that class name. So there's actually a function in jQuery which is called toggle class. Okay? And then we're going to toggle a class called open. And that's it. So to test it, obviously it's going to inspect to make sure we see what's happening. So if everything's worked correctly, there's our nav tag there. See where it has class main menu? When we click that button, it should bolt on another class called open. And then when we click it again, open should disappear. So it's toggled, okay? So let's do it. Oh, no, it's bringing up the click me. Ah, oh, it's probably, probably refreshed. Okay, cool, it's working now. All right. Sometimes you might have to refresh a few times just to clear the JavaScript cache, because it doesn't um, clear as often. So now when I click it, there's our nav open. So when we click it, it should have open appear there. Fingers crossed. Hey, there we go. See? Remove, there it is, and removed. The cool thing about the Chrome Inspector is that you know it does um, just pop up in purple there, so you can see when anything's been dynamically changed on the page with, um, with JavaScript. So that's awesome. So now we know that once you've clicked it, it has a class called open. So now we need to go into our CSS and actually put the styles for the open class, don't we? So in our responsive awesomeness here, you'll see, here we go. This is where we hide our menu and underneath. We want to say, hey, when this nav, which has a class name of main uh, main menu, also has an additional class called open, which is what we say here, that word there. We want it to display, yeah, block. Let's see if that works. Yay! And there we go. Easy as that. That's all you need to know. Pretty simple, right? All we've done is say, hey, grab the button when it's clicked, grab the nav, you know, toggle this class on and off. And then in CSS, we state what that class does. It adds display block, naturally it's display none. And that's how it works. Awesome. All right, I think the last thing we want to do, this is something that you guys can do in class. We can go through and have a little play around with how you can then use what we've learned now about the responsive CSS to adjust these things. But one real simple thing I'm going to do is show you, is fix up these three columns, right? Okay, um, so let's jump into that. Let's have a look. I'm going to, so that's our, our, our entire header menu kind of done now, so we're really happy with that. And obviously you could jump in, you make this button a little bit smaller so it's not overhanging. And obviously it's overhanging because of the, the float problem, but I'll let you guys figure that out. It's a pretty simple thing to fix, to tweak. Um, so yeah, we've got our functionality there, that's great. Okay, this, this three columns down here, let's sort that out. So let's go back up to where our columns are. Where are they, where are they, where are they? There we go these columns. Let's just put a background color back on them so we can see them. Oops, color, let's put that orange again. Ah, cool, excellent, all right. So that's how they look. We're pretty happy with that functionality, but well then once it gets down to mobile size, it's just not looking good, is it? No, it's just too tiny. So probably the first thing we want to do is, is make these, you know, stack on top of each other. So to do that, we have our whip set, don't we? So if we were to go display block, remember display block, it goes on its own line. So let's, first of all, let's copy the selector for this for these columns and let's go into our responsive media query here. This is where all our mobile CSS is applied. Let's scroll down to the bottom here. And let's put it here. And again, just to make sure I've actually got it working, let's just set the background color to purple for these columns when it's on mobile, just to make sure it's working. So normally it's orange, just refreshed. Now, there we go. So we, we definitely know that this CSS is working. Okay, so if we want these to stack on top of each other, they they really need to go on their own line, don't we? So we could just go display, oops, block, refresh. Ah, well, that works. I mean, they are now stacking on top of each other, but as we know, display block means they sit on their own line, but we've still got this width, don't we? 
and that width is still there because we haven't we haven't told the response of CSS to get rid of it. So it's still always going to be 29.3%. Um, so that's not not useful for us. So display block, you know, gets us halfway there. <laughs> what happens if we just display the width is 100%? Ah, that's better. That's much, much better. But also another problem we need to keep in consideration is that remember we had margins on this as well, don't we? So we now have a width of 100% plus a margin on the left and right of 2%. So that's 2 plus 2 plus 100. So that's actually making our width 104%. So we probably want to also set the margin on the left to be 0 and the margin on the right to be 0 as well. Let's refresh that. Cool. And there we go. So we've got three columns that are now stacked into one. Awesome. And one last thing I want to do is remember the our good old friend, the container that we made? We've used it a few times, haven't we? We've used our container there. We've also used our container there. And this container is really useful. This is why we reuse it, because it sets the width, doesn't it? So we've set the width to 80% for our, for our inside content areas. So for there and for there. But maybe 80% for mobile is, is not big enough, because this gap is probably a little bit too big. I mean, screen size can get quite small, and that's, that's probably prime real estate we probably want to use up. So we might want to set our... And as soon as we get down to mobile devices, this 80% isn't big enough. So we want to change that. So let's go to our responsive awesomeness. And because that's quite, you know, quite a common class that we're using everywhere, and no doubt as you build your website, you'll be using this container class quite a lot. So it's probably one of the first things we want, we want to change in our responsive um, CSS here. So we're going to go dot .container, and we're going to say, hey, width, let's put it 96%. It's pretty big. Come back here, refresh. That's better. So that gap is much smaller now. Much, much better. And there we go. So let's just get rid of our background color of orange. Wherever it is. Oh, that's right. We did it up here, didn't we? Yep. And we set the orange there. So, And there we go. So now we have a nice three column layout that as soon as it gets down to mobile, there we go, boom, it all stacks and goes single column. And it works quite nicely. So the next step I probably think you guys would want to do is jump into your, your header in here, well our hero section. I'll probably set your headline to have a width of, you know, 100%. Same with your space, dude. Width of 100%. So they stack on top of each other. Actually, probably 100 is quite a lot. Let's go 70. There we go. I'd probably even jump into your the whole hero section here, and I'll probably just set the text align to center. See, look, just with three little things there, it's looking way better now, isn't it? And I'll do also jump onto your little space dude there. There he is. I'll probably put a margin on the top, say, I don't know, 40 pixels or something. Beautiful. So there we go. That's um pretty good um, all around tutorial about how we set up responsiveness. So remember, we always the very first step is we put our meta tag at the top there, jump into our style sheet, we put it at the very bottom, we add a new chapter so we can just visually see where it is. Then we make a media query, where we say, hey, only for this size device, start a curly bracket, make sure you end it down here, it's very important. And then you put inside, yeah, you put inside all of your custom CSS changes from above. There we go, that's how pretty much wraps it up. Um, and I'll see you at the next lesson. Cheers.